Welcome back to Group and Rotor Company. This is the Tesla Roadster podcast, and my co-host... Mark Schaffner, good morning, and welcome to the podcast. So we always have an image behind us, and um, yesterday, actually, we uh, had a uh, broadcast studio, which was kind of cool. What I'm starting to do is, rather than dig into my um, repository of photographs that I've taken for 40 years, maybe even 50... Um, I'm starting to use artificial intelligence. And uh, this is a program called MidJourney, which I highly recommend you investigate. It's addictive, it's uh, lots of fun, and uh, it, it uh, really uh, invites a lot of uh, experimentation in creating the correct prompt to get what you want. And uh, what I've noticed is artificial intelligence isn't that intelligent yet. You really have to think about what it doesn't know yeah. and then, you know, yeah. try to uh, make it, uh, well, you have to dumb it down a bit, I guess, and be very specific. But anyway, this was a prompt that basically said, I want to see a 2008 silver Tesla Roadster um, on a dock with some yachts in the background, and it uh, pulled it off fairly well. Pretty well. I mean, the, uh, the, the wheels and tires seem really big for that, uh -huh. uh, for that Roadster. Uh, you know, more like a 16-inch wheel when the, when the Roadster really has just a 13-inch. Uh, the yachts look uh, pretty similar, but uh, overall, I'm impressed. Yeah, yeah. The, and it always tries to put a gas cap somewhere, and I'm pretty sure there's one on that. You can kind of see it, I think, behind the uh, driver's rear wheel. Um, but... Um, yeah, uh, the tires, by the way, are 16 and 17. 16 in front and 17 in the oh, rear. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, some of my first cars had 13-inch tires. I had a Ford Falcon with 13-inch tires. I, it just doesn't seem like you could uh, uh, you know, put that on a car and have it function properly, but that's what they were back then. Yeah, they lot, lots of spin. Uh, you know, the, uh, YouTube, Trucker Alistair. Trucker, good morning. We were just talking about whether or not we'd uh, hear from you today. Uh, good morning, guys. He says, great to see you guys again. Greetings from Canada and Nova Scotia. Very cool. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, we've got some news items, and um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, uh, start with was <clears throat> you often get, um, uh, you know, ads. Uh, it used to be direct mail for uh, local car shops, independents, mm -hmm. you know, small runs, and uh, and they would attempt to get your business and describe what they're capable of doing and what they're going to be able to do for your car. Well, I got one from um, a large company, not just a local, uh, uh, you know, tire store. And uh, this is actually from Firestone and uh, Complete Auto Care. I mean, this is a nationwide collection of franchised auto repair centers. And they were trying to get my uh, Tesla Roadster business. Okay. Um, and they were telling me in this ad that uh, we can do wheel alignment, strut replacement. Okay, that's all good stuff. But then power steering fluid. Well, someone didn't do their homework. The Tesla Roadster does not have power steering. Um, and then they went on ball joint lubrication that I'll buy wheel bearing replacement. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and um, let's see, overheated engine. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> where's the I engine? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so it goes on, and then if your radiator needs replacement, we can handle that for you. Well, you know, somebody clearly didn't do their homework. And again, with a small auto shop, I would kind of expect that, but uh, with a large nationwide chain, somebody really blew it. Then the final part was, when should I switch my Tesla Roadster to high mileage oil? And that was one of my favorite ones. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, we were talking just prior to the show about... Uh, us getting a, a roadster in from Europe and uh, talking to customs, and they said, Well, y your car can't have an engine in it, so you're gonna have to take out the engine. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you, you told them, what'd you tell them again? Well, for shipment. And, uh, you know, I mean, these were customs people. And, of course, they, they have rule books. Right. And they follow those rule books to the letter of the law, mm -hmm. never once thinking, is it an appropriate thing to do? Because they're supposed to just simply follow policy and protocol. So we were trying to get a roadster, buy a parts roadster from Hungary. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it became way too complicated because the first thing they wanted us to do is remove the engine before shipment. I pointed out, well, where's the engine? There is no engine. Well, isn't there anything like an engine? Well, I said, there's an electric motor. 
well, then why don't you remove that? And I said, well, why? And of course, yeah. they couldn't answer that, you know. So we, we finally gave up. Uh, you know, the Roadster probably uh, served just as useful a purpose as a part stoner in Europe as it would have here, but uh, it was a lightning green, actually, that we oh, were never able wow. to. Yeah. And that's one of the rarest colors here, so... But yeah, that's when I see this Firestone article, it makes me think of that. Yeah, yeah. Look at the questions coming wow, in, all right? great. <laughs> TikTok, Alan, he says, what about blinker fluid? Yeah, that would have been a good one, yeah, too. Yeah, that would have been a good one. Um, and then uh, Alan says from a TikTok, is that the Tesla car that went to space? Uh, the one behind us is a artificial intelligence creation. And uh, the one in space, by the way, is called Cherry Red. It's a custom red color. And it's VIN 686. Everybody thinks that Elon sent his founders number one. I, I don't think he would do that. I think he realizes that's going to be worth a lot of money someday. I mean, not that he needs it, but still, you know, you wouldn't quite discard that and send it into outer space as a publicity stunt. Right, right. Now, for our TikTok audience, they might not be able to see the uh, Silver Roadster with the yachts in the background. Um, we're working with TikTok. Eventually, uh, eventually, TikTok will allow the platform to expand to where... Things like green screen pictures can be seen. At this point, we're just mm -hmm. kind of stuck. And for those of you that like the uh, old game of find the bloopers or find the error, we've been posting some of these AI-generated Tesla Roadsters on our Facebook site. It's called uh, Tesla Roadster Owners Group. And uh, it's always fun to uh, find a gas cap somewhere on there or too many louvers or too many spokes on the wheels, you know? Oh, sure. But those are the things that AI is not quite nailed yet. And um, apparently, I was watching a video, of, you can actually train AI, uh, you can actually educate it, and uh, kind of like you used to do with um, the um, uh, the Wiki uh, program. Okay, you know, okay. Wikipedia. Um, so that's gonna be cool because it will, of course, learn immediately uh, as you're uh, educating it. You know, it, it reminds me a little bit of the science fiction movies where you have the robot that um, wants is, is dumb and knows that it needs to educate itself, and so it's flipping through books like that. Right. <laughs> and then it comes out, and it's a you know doctoral level education. The AI is not that far off of that exact thing. Uh, totally. The the difference between human intelligence and digital intelligence is uh, quite striking. Yes. Guys, that sounds like a good video. What do you think? the difference between digital and human intelligence, and we go into all of that. We're just fascinated by it, by the way. Um, I know that it deviates at times from our original core mission, which was alternative energy, um, you know, EVs, but uh, we've always been into high tech, so we're beginning to insert some artificial intelligence components into these uh, podcasts. Most definitely. Green energy, fusion, nuclear energy, um, artificial intelligence, uh, just lots of fun topics there. It looks like our author, Ingemar Anderson, joined us from Facebook. Greetings, Ingemar. Uh, we were uh, featuring his book the other day uh, in one of our earlier podcasts a couple of weeks ago or so. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, greetings, he says, from Ingemar in Seattle. Love the AI image created by Midjourney. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Most definitely. Sinclair Simons from Facebook uh, sends us greetings from Bermuda. Um, I would love to be on an island by the sea right now. You know, one of the images that I had AI render was a roadster on an island. Um, in fact, I think it's on our Facebook site. Uh, for those of you interested, oh, it did a pretty good job. This morning, I, I told it, uh, do one under the water, very clear water. And uh, it wasn't deep enough, so it didn't look very convincing. But there was seaweed under the roadster. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm telling you, it's addicting, folks. And uh, if, if you want to waste a lot of time or spend <laughs> a lot of time on something, uh, it, it's, it's definitely a, a fun project. Trucker Alistair says, I'm driving at the time and enjoying your podcast. Just love it. Well, welcome, Trucker. Um, oh, TikTok, our first sunglass question from uh, Brooklyn Staten. He says... Please explain the sunglasses. You know, we don't have a good explanation at this point that we can offer, but we are working on a video that will reveal the reasons why there are usually sunglasses involved in the Gruber video productions or podcast productions. And I think it'll be quite, um, uh, quite revealing to everyone once we do uh, come out of the closet with oh, the yes. sunglass issue. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, now, and in the meantime, I'm going to use this as time to give a plug for the sunglass cases that we have out here, because these are for sale for people. 
Uh, we have the uh, signature series uh, sunglass cases. The first 100 people who buy are going to be able to get a signature series. And we'll even go so far as to uh, custom engrave your own car's VIN number on this if you so desire. Which, of course, is perfect for the Roadster owners since everybody knows their VIN. That's how they uh, you know, recognize or remember their car. That's right. Including color and some other things that aren't quite as important as that VIN, I've noticed. But we will actually create a custom sunglass case for you with your uh, VIN number or the, um, uh, the pedigree, if it's a signature series or a founder series or, you know, so, um, yeah. Uh, it'll be on our website when, guys? I just finished uh, updating the site this morning, so I'm going to be implementing our sh uh, show times are going to be on the front page, and then the product will be added as well. So give me about probably next week, I would say. Okay. Well, thank okay. you. That's enough for the sales pitch at this point. Yes. All right. So getting back to the questions, YouTube Lightning Rod, he says, hello from Thunder Bay, Canada. The heat here is 25 centigrade, and uh, that that's that's warm. Yeah, about 75 degrees or so. Fahrenheit? Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's gorgeous. Uh, Rob Peterson on YouTube has a question for us. He says, speaking of tires, do you still put on the Yokohama Advan Neova 8007 tires or others? You know, some people in the Roadster community have been complaining that the original tires have been going away, that they're becoming scarce. Honestly, we have not found that to be a problem. We use Tire Rack in uh, Nevada. And uh, they've been able to simply meet our requirements. Um, I'm not sure about the Advan uh, Neova AD07. If you're interested in some tire tech, um, we've got on our website in the newsletter section, there's a whole newsletter about uh, tires and considerations and options. Um, there's a lot more information there off the top of my head. I just don't recall everything that's in that newsletter. TikTok, Alan asks us, where does the lithium in the battery come from? We've been talking about that actually. Yeah. You know, the a lot of the a lot of the lithium on the on the batteries, now these are Panasonic batteries, correct? These individual cells? Well they've been changing. The roadsters? Yeah, yeah, they've been changing. Original was Panasonic Sanyo, then they went to LG for a while, okay. and now we've got Cattle involved and uh, they're making LFP cells. Yep. Um, and Tesla's making its own 4680 cells in, in right, Nevada. Right. And they just broke ground in Texas on a uh, lithium uh, uh, mining lithium operation. Re yeah, yeah, refinery, if I remember right. And those of you really interested in this, 60 Minutes Sunday had a piece, 20 sec or a 20 minute piece on uh, a discovery of high concentrations of lithium in um, geothermal brine that they're pumping up around the Salton Sea. And they claim that the, that the recovery in this area will exceed most of the mining operations on the planet currently. So no longer do we have to go to Bolivia and brine ponds to get our lithium. Sure. Okay. Uh, we'll be able to do that in the United States, both in Texas, apparently, and in um, the uh, Salt and Sea area. You know, I, I know that of the proven reserves of lithium, about 90% are between Chile, China, and Australia. Mm -hmm. And of those proven reserves, the Chinese actually own the land and mining operations in, in most of those reserves. So that's been kind of a, 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 a part of contention, why the $7,500 tax credit to go to the U.S. and so on and so forth. But it, it's almost like the gold rush of the 1840s and 1850s. You, yeah. you really don't know what all is out there until you start looking for it. And uh, lithium reserves are being found, it seems like, every week. And then the scary part for a manufacturer or an investor investing in this mining type or this uh, you know, lithium mining, the battery technology is going to rapidly evolve into other things than lithium. Yeah. We keep talking about that, you know, the, the, the sodium ion battery, the aqueous battery, the graphene battery, and eventually batteries, our prediction is, are going to go away. It seems silly to carry a thousand pound energy storage source in your transportation method. Uh, once we get into some uh, more efficiencies and possibly fusion or a power plant in these vehicles, you know, I think the DC storage will eventually go away. I, I think you're I think you're right on that. And the fact that the, most of these mines have uh, as much as a 10 year ramp up period before they're fully producing, uh, there's potential of a lot of risk there. You I mean, look back 10 years ago, 
Uh, that's 2013. The Model S was brand new. Nobody thought that Tesla was ever going to become anything. And uh, elect electric cars were more of an afterthought than a uh, thought of a revolution. Right. It looks like Trucker Alistair commented, and he said, sunglasses. He said, you said that last year, and you know you're right, Trucker. Yes. But as long as the suspense and the, uh, and the inquiry and the, uh, you know, all of the excitement around these sunglasses continues to build, it just doesn't seem like a good idea to reveal it. It's sort of like the magician who never shows his tricks, you know? Eventually, I'm sure that we will, but uh, we're just not ready to yet. Yeah, yeah. It's still way too exciting at this point. But uh, it is worth the wait, guys. So Definitely yeah. is. Uh, Greg Smith on Facebook says, Pete, I love your videos on Facebook. Very informative about Tesla cars. Thank you. Well, yeah, you're, uh, you're more than welcome. It's our social media team that really keeps all of this information relevant, alive, and shares it with the community. Uh, Rob Peterson joined us. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome, Rob. Uh, he, he has a Roadster question. He says, any update on the three storage Roadsters found in China? Yes, Rob. And uh, by the way, thank you. We've been in contact with you through, um, uh, through email as well. Um, the latest on the three Roadsters is the bidding now has gone up to $750,000 for all mm -hmm. three Roadsters. Um, everybody asks, where do you think it will end up? And, uh, you know, I did a, a wag with a, a podcast last week, and I said probably a million is where I would, you know, think would be a reasonable price for cars of this caliber, this pedigree, you know, this unusual one of uh, um, uh, status. But um, at this point, it is uh, $750,000. I was supposed to get additional pictures yesterday, which did not arrive yet. And we will be posting those on the uh, site, um, on the listing. And that's also where the bid, um, um, uh, the bid levels are, by the way. Um, we did get additional information, though. And this had to do with a uh, request from one of our podcast uh, viewers about a apparent typo in the Tesla Model S owner's manual mm -hmm. where it suggested or recommended charging to 100%. Yes. And, uh, of course, this goes contrary to everything that uh, anyone has been saying. The mantra is 80 90% maximum on lithium-ion. You actually can cause damage if you go to 100% long-term. It, de um, it degrades the lifespan. So we were curious what was going on. And um, uh, fortunately, we have a pipeline to Tesla, and I was able to get a hold of corporate, and I ran this by them. And they said, you know, it looks like a typo to us as well. It looks like somebody just did a cut and paste between two different manuals. Right. The, um, the cattle LFP cells in the Model 3 do get charged 100%. But the, um, the original 18650 lithium ion cells, the ones that are in the Model S and the Roadster, 100% will degrade that battery fairly quickly. So if you're charging to 100% and you believed the, um, uh, the manual, go back to 80-90%. That's a much safer place for you to charge. Now, when uh, you were talking to Tesla, they had a, uh, some information update on the, uh, on the battery packs and what may have happened with those battery packs on the three roadsters that are in those shipping containers too, right? Exactly. So um, I asked them, I said, um, do you guys know anything about this? And it just so happened that the gentleman I was talking to was there back in the day when they were shipping cars, mm -hmm. when they were shipping roadsters and releasing them. And uh, he clarified quite a bit, actually. He said, first of all, um, I asked about the, um, let me go to that portion here. Um, I asked about the possibility of these packs still being good, and I'll get to that in a minute here. But the main thing was, how did they prepare these cars for shipment? Well, he corroborated that, yes, indeed, they would pull the service plugs on these roadsters before shipment, which makes a ton of sense because if you have a roadster sitting you know, in storage or in transport and you're not charging it, uh, they get bricked fairly quickly, a couple, three months, and you know that car could be um, uh, completely inoperative. Well, we've even seen where a Roadster battery that's sitting off of a charge could, in as little as 10 days to two weeks, go from virtually full to vir a virtually empty battery. Right. And then the Roadster starts beeping at you. Um, I can't imagine something that is known to take four to six weeks or longer, like ocean freight, um, where you would 
ever ship a Roadster and not pull the service plug because otherwise every battery would be bricked. Mm-hmm. So someone else had commented that, uh, well, all Roadsters were shipped with only a 25% charge, and that was to satisfy um, the, uh, the safety requirements for shipping lithium-ion batteries. Yes. Well, he clarified a bit further. The 25% only applied to air transport. So if it was shipped by air and Tesla shipped it, they would uh, de- degrade the battery uh, or bleed the battery. I guess that's mm-hmm. a better word, with load banks, I'm assuming, down to 25% state of charge. If it was an ocean-going transport, like these were in sea containers, then it was a 50% state of charge. But he said if the owner shipped the car themselves, all bets are off. They may have been shipped at 100%. And it's fundamentally because you know the, um, uh, the owners may not realize that they needed to take steps to uh, reduce the state of charge in the batteries. And even if they did realize it, they, wouldn't have any, uh, they would not have had any means to do so. Right. So other than calling in Tesla, of course. So I asked them at that point, I said, all right, uh, knowing all this and knowing that we had a roadster that was almost a year and a half without a charge with the service plug pulled and the battery was fine. In fact, it sat outside during Phoenix summer, an entire summer. And then a German uh, roadster repair, uh, Mars Orbiter, Conrad Buck said, Mm -hmm. I had one that was six years and with the service plug pulled and the battery came back to life as well. So I asked our Tesla corporate contact, do you think maybe 13 years is pushing it? And he said, probably. But again, there's some doubt. We don't know. And until those roadsters get here and we're able to uh, do a technical analysis, uh, we don't know whether these packs have survived for 13 years. Yeah, we just, we don't know. Um, I thought it was notable that he, he did tell you that unequivocally when a roadster left, the service bug was pulled. Mm-hmm. So, so we do know that uh, that the service plug would have been pulled. Whether it would have been reinserted for them to get in the container, we don't know. But uh, I think it's going to be much more likely that the service plugs were pulled on these roadsters before they were shipped than right. not. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll continue a bit of this discussion here in a moment. I'd like to tell you who's trying to buy them, what they're trying to do with them, and I have some definite suggestions about what these roadsters should be going uh, or used for in the future. By all means. Um, LinkedIn, uh, Christopher Moss, uh, when talking about battery technologies, he says it won't be hydro. That's way too risky. Yeah. And uh, of course, the other thing is complexity. I mean, you've got a lot of plumbing there. You've got a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, mechanical processes. Yeah. And, uh, look at the simplicity of an electric vehicle. I mean, really, when you condense it, you've got a AC three-phase induction motor, you've got a battery system, and some electronics that convert DC to AC. And Very much. It, yeah, yeah, that's about it. Um, and then without a transmission, you know, that reduces things enormously too. And then you delete gas tank and exhaust system and, uh, you know, all of the, um, uh, uh, the emission sensing and, you know, it, it, it becomes quite a bit simpler. Quite a bit. I, you know, I think I've heard the, I've heard it told to me before, uh, where an ICE engine and transmission and, you know, mechanical components is, uh, have about 2,500 different distinct parts. An electrical system is maybe less than 100. Yeah. I've heard actually 2,000 versus 18 to 20. So it's a substantial percentage. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. For those of you that work on ICE vehicles, I mean, think about all of the rotational stuff that you have going on, just even in the engine block between bearings and pistons and rings and uh, all of the plumbing and all of the fluid flows and uh, the pulleys and you know, I mean, it, it, it just goes on and on. And then from there, it extends into exhaust systems and, uh, uh, you know, oxygen sensors. Uh, it just, um, uh, the transmission, I mean, those things are an, a mechanical marvel. Oh, my uh, gosh, yes. You know, that's why most of the, um, uh, the auto dealers send that out to specialists to uh, repair and rebuild the uh, mm-hmm. transmissions. On TikTok, Apple user uh, 982283 uh, asks us, where are you guys located at, and are you guys answering the questions? We're not AI. We're not robots. We are actually humans here answering the questions. Yes. 
And uh, I'm not sure we wanted to admit that, considering all the mystique around the sunglasses. And well, the reason is that we've got robotic eyes and that we're hiding them. But anyway. Or we could be living in the Matrix. Yeah, yeah, that too. We are located in Phoenix, Arizona, sir. And uh, if you'd like to come by and take a tour of our service center in Phoenix here, uh, Gruber Motor Company, we give tours daily. People love it. Uh, it is a... Um, it's a predictor for what every auto shop on the planet is going to eventually look like and be. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing that makes it unique is the nostalgia. Uh, we have over 50 Tesla Roadsters at any point in time, and uh, it's like going back to Tesla back in the early days before the Model S. Um, so it is definitely a, a, a nostalgia trip for most people as well that were familiar with the old Roadster days. Um, on YouTube, Lightning Rod has come back to us and says, I cannot think of a better or more fitting home for these roadsters than Gruber Motors. Good luck. Well, thank you. Thank you. We uh, posted a Facebook picture on the um, Tesla Roadster Owners Group this morning on Facebook, and uh, we uh, are showing the beautiful roadsters sitting there. We have somebody in the service center that continuously wipes them and keeps them clean and waxes them and uh, yeah. everything just glistens and gleams in there. And then of course the floors are immaculate, no oil stains and uh, we run a pretty tight ship. We uh, take a lot of pride in our service center and it shows. Definitely do. Watch Rich Rebuild's channel on YouTube is back with us this morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, after Roadsters, he says, can't Elon see all the low or zero mile Teslas through the MCUs until the 3G totally goes away? Well, actually the Roadster was 2G and it's been gone for years. Uh, you can't see them anymore. Tesla can't see them anymore. Um, there is an aftermarket device called Open Vehicle Management, uh, OVMS uh, system. And uh, a lot of uh, Roadster owners are upgrading or restoring the capability to tune into their car with this little black box that was actually developed by uh, someone in the community, the Roadster community. Mark, um, Mark Webb Johnson and his team right, right. did a great job of restoring that capability, and they continue to improve and enhance it so it can do even more things than just simply look at the charge level in your car. It even gets into TPMS sensors and... Um, we, we're excited about it because we can use it as a diagnostic tool often. Definitely <laughs> is. And uh, I know that we've done a number of installs for people on that, and it's become a, one of our more popular upgrades for the Roadsters. Mm -hmm. um, got a YouTube question. Ray Johnson is joining us. Hello, Ray. Um, Ray is actually involved in uh, one of the Facebook sites where they talk about the um, uh, Tesla Model S BMS 029 errors. And he was the one that found this 100% uh, charge suggestion as being a typo in, their, um, in the Tesla Model S owner's manual. He says, thanks for running to ground, LOL, this 100% charge conundrum. Uh, you're more than welcome. Mm -hmm. We were just glad that we could get a hold of Tesla so quickly. And he said also, he's, or um, he's asking, would the seller consider selling VIN number three and um, uh, the Model S and the Roadster separately. Now, let me explain here. Out on our Roadster matchmaking site, we have Founders Series, Tesla Roadster number three, and Founders Series, Tesla Model S number three. This particular owner uh, was a VIP and uh, was able to actually get Founders number three, which um, uh, in the Roadster world means that... Uh, um, uh, uh, number one is Elon's car. Number yep. two is uh, Martin Eberhardt's car. Mm -hmm. So he has number three. He's now selling that. It's in our service center. It's a radiant red. It's on the, um, it is on the Roadster matchmaking site. But he also was able to land the uh, Tesla Model S Founders number three. In fact, there's a video when they released the, um, uh, the Tesla Model S's George Blankenship and um, Elon are up on stage, and they're beginning to talk about the first Model S's that are rolling off the assembly line. And VIN number three, Founders number three, which is a signature red, was part of that lineup. And uh, the owner, current mm -hmm. owner, actually was handed the keys by Elon to this uh, Founders VIN number three Model S. I tell you, what a way to take a car. So it's got some history. 
And uh, we don't have any bids on those yet, but the question that um, uh, that was posed just now would, would the customer be willing to separate those cards? Um, I, we'll certainly ask. I would suspect not because really the combination of the two is what makes it so unique and so special. Right. You know, you're never going to get two founders number three Teslas ever again. This is it. There, there, there's, there's only one pair like this. Yeah, that, that, that's that's a one a one in a, of a kind type of pairing that'll be virtually impossible to ever get again. And there are some other founders cars out there that are for sale. Model S's from time to time. Um, one of our customers actually just bought Founders Model S number thirty nine. Okay. And uh, it turns out that it belonged to Elon's ex-wife, Justine Musk. Oh. And he didn't realize this when he bought the car. Unfortunately, it was an uh, insurance purchase, and so it has a salvage title. Okay. But he purchased it just for the fact that it was a founder's car, and then doing a little bit of digging, he found out this has an additional pedigree, which is that it was Justine's car at one point in time. That's actually pretty cool. And I think that pedigree would more than make up for the fact that, that it's a salvage title. It's a title. salvage, yeah. Yeah, it would offset that. You know, I've, I know that we've seen some salvage title Model S's come through our shop here in past years where uh, you're scratching your head as to why it's ever a salvage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, I know at the, uh, what was it, 2017, I think, after one of the hurricanes, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, I think was one of them, we got a few Model S's into the shop that were flood damaged and totaled, and more than one of those Model S's ended up driving off of the uh, transport vehicle. I remember that. And it was nothing more than doing a, a quick cleanup and disinfectant job inside the uh, cabin, and the car was ready to go. Yeah. Without painting a blue sky picture here, though, be careful with auction cars, uh, especially the flood yeah. damaged ones. We had winners and losers. And it was just like going into a casino. Uh, the losers were painful, believe me. So, well, we had that that hundred D in a satin green that we thought, oh, this is it. This is right. our biggest winner yet. And only to find out after the fact, once we got the car, that it had corrosion in the electronics because it had been sitting in salt water, not fresh water, and barnacles on the chargers underneath the rear seat. Yeah, yes. basically. Yes. It was a P one hundred D before the Plaid came out, so it was the ultimate performance, uh, you know, Tesla Model S. Yes. Um. So well, uh, we've got. Uh, I know you've got some information on your Tesla Roadsters. Yeah, I thought maybe uh, we could throw up a picture first, guys. Can okay. you throw up the celebrity-owned roadsters? And uh, what we've been doing is um, collecting from our viewers at times the um, what celebrities own Tesla roadsters. And in our podcast last week, we had uh, uh, Kim Java on, and uh, she actually showed us a video clip in L.A., when they ran into a roadster there, and it turns out Rob Schneider was driving it. So we put Rob Schneider up there under the census program on our website, where we show how many roadsters are left, and a portion of that is the celebrity-owned roadsters. What we don't know yet is what VIN Rob Schneider had, and that's always of interest to the roadster community because uh, we do everything with VINs. We've got Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, VIN missing there, and Leonardo DiCaprio, that VIN is also missing. So any of you that would like to pipe up and fill in that gap, we would appreciate it. My son is actually friends with one of Rob Schneider's friends, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend yeah, type yeah. thing. And uh, so I emailed him a couple days ago asking to uh, get some contact information for Rob so that we can find out what his VIN was. He no longer owns it apparently. But um, I'd love to have Rob Schneider on our uh, podcast. We've had another comedian like him at some point in the, uh, f um, uh, the past. And, uh, you know, I, um, I know his real name is Rob Schneider, but mm -hmm. the name that I always associate with his look is Deuce Bigelow. I just can't get that out of my head. <laughs> so if, if you're watching Rob or Deuce, uh, please contact us. We'd like to do two things, get you on one of our podcasts and also find out what roadster you had. And we'd love to talk about your roadster experience. Why did you sell? How much did you enjoy it? And the best part is do you want another one because we've got plenty on our matchmaking site. Most definitely. Now on TikTok, uh, Leaf Village Outcast uh, has uh, a great comment for us. Day 357 of asking, why you guys wear sunglasses indoors? Well, if this 
thread or this vein of questioning continues, I think we're going to be motivated to finally release that video about the sunglasses. Yeah. I think we're getting there. So, um, And I have another image for you guys to throw up. Um, we are um, seeing resistive cell roadsters. And it's, I don't know if uptick is the right word because we get a steady stream of them. But right. I thought it might be appropriate to explain what is going on with a resistive cell roadster, what your options are and what your best recourse is. And let me just give you an example of this. Um, last week, end of last week, one of our uh, roadster customers in Florida contacted me and said, Pete, I'm used to charging to 155 miles an hour. I just realized that I can only charge to 103 miles currently. So, um, I asked her, of course, about the charge method. Is your breaker tripped? Uh, what kind of cable are you using? What does it say? What are the other error codes on there? And there weren't on it. Just said, I'm done charging, and it's 103 miles. So I said, all right, we'll do this. Plug it back in. Let's look at it tomorrow, um, uh, tomorrow morning, after a charge, and see where it ends up. And what right. I was suspecting was a resistive cell because the symptom with a resistive cell is range decline. The next day she calls me and she says, it's down to 93 miles. I said, okay, we've got a resistive cell. Now we can go through the log file analysis and all that, but really time is not on our side at this point, especially mm -hmm. if, you're, um, if you're losing eight miles a day. Um, this morning, by the way, it was down to 82 miles. So it is rapidly losing range. And um, let me see if there's another reading on that. I should have that in my computer here. There we go. Um, yeah, so we were, 170 was the original charge. Sorry about that. 103, then 90, and then 83. She's down to 83 currently. The car is being picked up today, by the way. So here's what's happening. When you get one of these 18650 cells inside that 1,000-pound battery pack, which has 6,831 of these that goes resistive, instead of it accepting a charge and holding a charge, it's actually acting parasitic, and it's draining the rest of the cells in that brick. Now, let's bring up some pictures here, guys. The first one is going to be Roadster battery number one. And I'm going to show you what this 1,000-pound battery pack looks like and where it's positioned inside the Tesla Roadster. And it's that big silver rectangular box, which is actually flat black, by the way, because it was built by a barbecue manufacturer in Thailand. I have to insert that. That's right. That's but on right. this rendering, it looks silver. That's where the um, uh, 6,831 batteries reside, just behind the seat and in front of the rear trunk. Now, there's another picture, which is number two. And that's going to show you what's inside this 1,000-pound battery pack. By the way, while the picture's coming up, mm -hmm. is that high-temperature black paint like they do on the barbecues? You know, it could be. I never thought about that. I yeah. never thought about it. But I, I <laughs> we'll have to put a torch to one in the shop <laughs> yeah. and see if it survives or blisters. So here we have, and by the way, this is a wonderful document that Tessa created back in the day on the Roadster, which um, has a lot of information about the internals and... Uh, so here it's showing with the cover removed on the front of the battery pack, they're showing 11 battery sheets. A, a uh, Roadster battery sheet has 621 of these lithium ion cells in each sheet. And each sheet, this is the next picture now, guys, number three, is a collection of bricks. And you might as well become familiar with this if you own a Roadster because this language is part of um, is a part of Roadster ownership. Mm -hmm. So there we're showing the sheet, and these are the collection of cell parallel connections in the bricks, and you have nine bricks, um, which are um, a collection of sixty nine cells. So when you have one of the cells going resistive, it is now draining the other sixty eight cells. And the reason it's doing that is, at this level, at the brick level, the cells are connected in series. So plus to plus to plus to plus, minus to minus to minus. The bricks themselves are connected in series. So plus to minus, which now adds voltage. A simple rule of um, um, electronics, electricity is, when you have a, 
a a four volt battery and you connect them all in parallel, your voltage remains the same, four volts, but your amperage increases based on the number of cells. In series, the opposite happens. Your voltage increases, but your amperage stays the same. Now, you had just mentioned that both the cells inside the bricks and the bricks themselves were connected in series. Mm -hmm. But the cells inside the bricks are connected in parallel, correct? Correct. Okay. So they're parallel connected cells, 69 of them in parallel, and that one cell is going to drain the rest of the cells. And what makes it so hard to find that one resistive cell is the fact that they're connected in parallel and all the cells look the same. Sure. Um, So we have special processes that actually help isolate that one resistive cell. And then what we do is we neutralize, we first isolate and then we neutralize it. And I'll get into that in a moment, how we do that. So nine bricks, 69 cells connected in parallel, and one of those bricks is not able to charge or hold a charge. So what it does is it declines in voltage. Mm -hmm. Inside the Roadster, there's an enormous amount of battery safety management firmware and hardware. And in order to make sure that you don't have a thermal event, fancy word for fire, they will not allow a charge to anything higher than the lowest brick in the car. Sure. So as this resistive cell gets worse and drains those, those uh, bricks, it eventually begins to bring down the charge levels until you get to zero eventually. So your recourse as an owner, you're beginning to realize that you're losing range. Now, by the way, an acceptable range loss in a Tesla Roadster is on the order of maybe two to three miles per year. That's not uncommon based on aging batteries. That's why you went from 180 some odd miles, uh, you know, at the uh, standard charge down to maybe 150, 10, 15 years later. When you realize you've got a resistive cell, you're going to lose a couple, three miles per charge, or in this, in this particular customer's case, eight to 10 miles per charge. So what some customers do is they decide, well, you know what, let me take it to the Tesla Roads to the uh, service center, the Tesla service centers first. You can do that, but time's not on your side. The only option that Tesla can offer you with a resistive cell declining range type situation is a battery replacement. Well, you may not be ready to spring for a $30,000 battery replacement, nor is it necessary, considering that we can isolate which brick that problem is in, and we can take that cell out of service, which then restores full functionality in the car. So time is not on your side. The quicker it gets to a service center like ours where we can put it on life support, we can make sure that the uh, cell levels do not get below two volts in a lithium ion 18650 cell. Um, We put it on a power supply and we make sure that we keep it above two volts until a lift frees up and we're able to do surgery, which means dropping the thousand pound battery pack taking out the, um, uh, the sheet that has the problem. And um, I think we have another image here that we can throw up, which is Roadster battery number four. And that shows the cells. Never mind, Jesse, we've already shown the cell. I think we're okay. Now, my background is not in electricity and batteries. Uh, my background is in IT and in finance. Uh, as a result, uh, I had to ask myself the question, okay, what, what exactly is a resistive cell in a term that I might be able to understand myself or that I might be able to explain to my wife who is very much not into electricity? Mm-hmm. Um, see, a, a electrical resistance, this is for you guys out here. And, um, and for those of us who are not electricians or into the batteries a lot, simply put, electrical resistance is opposition to electrical current. Um, it's kind of like if electricity is water going through a garden hose, you crimp the hose. Um, when, you, when you crimp the hose, the flow of the water slows down, you get a lot less water out of your hose. That's resistance. Now, overcoming this resistance requires energy. Um, the energy expended to overcome resistance dissipates off the battery as heat. Uh, a thermal runaway, by the way, is nothing more than um, excessive heat. Excessive heat. Right. <laughs> when there's more heat being generated by a resistive battery than it can dissipate, 
it continues to ask for more and more energy, which produces more heat, but it can't dissipate all the heat, so it gets hotter, so it, you know, it's, and, and so on and so forth. Um, batteries typically have almost no internal resistance. Uh, th there's nothing uh, other than a superconductor that truly has virtually, that has really zero resistance, but they have very, very low resistance. Over time, batteries become more resistive. Uh, changes in the chemical composition of the battery as it charges and, un and discharges over time cause batteries to have resistance increase. Um, what happens is sometimes a single cell will will effect, effectively crimp itself off. It will um, get to a point where it's no longer storing energy, it's asking for energy to overcome resistance. And that's what a parasitic cell is. You have one cell out of those 69 in your brick that's no longer storing energy. It's asking for energy from the other cells so that it can try to get up to its minimum charge level, but it can never get up to its minimum charge level because of the resistance that's dissipating away as heat. Um, so eventually that weakens the brick, the overall level in the brick uh, voltage level in the brick goes down, and of course your battery safety management stuff in a roadster then takes over and says, well, gee, my highest brick now is at 3.6 volts, so I'm going to charge everything to 3.6 volts. Tomorrow, oh gee, my highest brick is at 3.5 volts, so I'm going to charge everything to 3.5 volts, and your range goes down. Yeah, exactly. So that's uh, mm -hmm. that's my kind of non-technical way of trying to understand this and why resistance is so bad, but also why resistance is so easy to fix. Mm -hmm. You don't have one garden hose here, you've got 69 garden hoses. Mm -hmm. And if we take one of those 69 garden hoses out of service, now you have electricity, throw, you know, you know, your water flowing through 68 garden hoses. Well, that's almost the same amount of water. and you're, It's so similar, it's so close that your battery doesn't notice and the resistance simply goes away so everything can come back up to normal. That was a great explanation, Mark, and I think you can explain this to Connie. I think I can. I think <laughs> <Okay>. I can. <laughs> so what's happening with this car? <clears throat> Fortunately, it's going to be here within three days, probably Monday next week. It may arrive with a 0% charge, state mm -hmm. of charge, which is okay because in a service center like ours, we immediately put them on life support and uh, it won't be hard bricked uh, based on that short a period of uh, bricking. Um, the preparation for this car was, of course, to uh, put it in tow mode in case it does get bricked mm -hmm. and then go on the transporter. One other um, symptom, by the way, with a Tesla Roadster is uh, a non-resistive cell but the car can't charge. And sometimes the cars can't charge because there's a problem in the PIM, because there's a problem in the electronics, might be even a problem in the battery. Um, pulling the service plug becomes very important because the service plug essentially puts the battery pack in a coma. Unfortunately, pulling a service plug on a resistive cell battery pack doesn't put it in a coma because this cell is going to bleed those 68 other cells whether that service plug is pulled or not. The service plug takes it away from any loads in the car, mm -hmm. which can help a bit, definitely, but it's certainly not going to prevent the rapid decline of that brick. And again, you don't want that brick getting below two volts or spending any time below two volts because there is a chemical destructive process that takes place in the original 18650 lithium ion cells that is going to kill the rest of the cells in that brick. And if you're thinking about, well, I'll just go to Checker Auto or AutoZone and buy another brick, another uh, sheet, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen that way. Um, if, you're, if you've killed a brick in a sheet, Sheets are extremely hard to come by because we have to rely on donor cars. No one is selling right. sheets individually. Tesla is making batteries again, but they're making a different type of battery. It's the 3.0 battery, which instead of a 2.2 amp hour cell uses a 3.2 amp hour cell, and they aren't those sheets aren't compatible with the old legacy packs. So you really have to address it quickly and uh, get the right people involved in uh, helping you manage it so that it can be recovered as quickly as possible. 
Definitely. Hey, we have a few questions that have come in again, uh, starting with uh, YouTube, My Melt. Uh, question is, so is Gruber Motors' dead cell locating process now proprietary, or will you at some point give out the process? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, we would probably create a lot of competition if we gave out the proprietary process for uh, finding that one resistive cell out of 69. We are, however, experimenting with different methods now. Um, in fact, we have yet again a method of using heat signatures, and that mm -hmm. may become uh, the new way for us to find it. Um, the um, replacement of cells, by the way, everybody asks that as well. Why don't you just simply change the cell? It's not necessary. Uh, what we do to, um, to neutralize a resistive cell, there are two bonding wires that go to collector plates on both sides of the cell. It's a very fine 30-gauge wire. It was originally inserted with an ultrasonic welder, and the cell itself is encapsulated in a epoxy, a thermal potting compound, which makes it destructive to try to remove a cell. It's not like your flashlight, where if you have a bad cell, you open up the end cap, you slide some new batteries in, and right. you got, you know, your right. flashlight's working again. You've got almost 7,000 of these in a car that are very difficult to get to, but the bottom line is, Disabling one cell or even 10 or 15 in a pack of 7,000, the car never realizes that those cells went MIA. Right, right, because it's simply, it never looks at anything more granular than the brick level, which is 69 cells. Right, exactly. And so um, I, do, I do know as well from having done some of the log file analysis, uh, the Tesla log files are a very good tool for us because they will help us to get to the right brick and right sheet right away. Mm-hmm. And it looks like uh, Niles is joining us from uh, Denmark. Uh, he's with the uh, Danish Genome Institute. He says, morning, after removing a resistive cell, how long does it usually take for the same to happen to another one? That is, what does the time distribution of cell lifespans look like? Great question. That is a great question. Yeah, Niles. The, um, what we're finding is that cell, um, a resistive cells are aberrations. They are not yet, and I say yet, indicative of an end-of-life experience for the Tesla Roadster cells. We just had a recent example within the last few months of an end-of-life situation with Tesla Roadsters, and it had to do right. with not the original packs that they put in the cars, but a replacement pack that, they came, that, um, uh, that uh, Tesla came out with in 2016 that used what appeared to be faulty or inferior cells, and they were beginning to die seven years after installation. So at some point in time, all 7,000 cells will begin to fail. But at this point, resistive cells appear to be an aberration, one of, and the hundreds of cars that we have put back on the road are actually functioning after a resistive cell repair like we do. I know we've had a few cars come back that have had a, a second or a third resistive cell come through. I, I think of that, that that chrome silver one that's very unique, mm -hmm. uh, came with a resistive cell three years ago, I think it was, and then came back with another resistive cell on a different sheet about a year later. But uh, am I right in thinking that most of the cars that we've put back on the road have not come back to us yet with more resistive cells. That is correct. And, um, you know, the if you brick a roadster and uh, it, it's, it can be recovered, it stresses the cells. And that's why we don't recommend range charges on these cells once they're marginalized. Right. It will weaken the cell. And uh, in that one that you mentioned that, um, uh, that came back, yeah. it was in a different sheet in a different area where we had worked, and it was yet another cell that was going resistive. Yes, that's what I thought. But it's very rare. I think there was one other one in Texas a couple, three years ago or so, and that customer opted to just, just simply wait for a new battery replacement. Okay. But once the end-of-life cell uh, decline starts, it's going to be rapid. It was the 2016 packs, right. if you remember, it wasn't just one cell that had an impedance problem, it was all of them. And it was almost as if uh, they were on a time schedule and uh, kind of like planned obsolescence where they all decided to fail at the same time. Yeah, that was, uh, that was remarkable and different because 
It wasn't uh, the log file coming back and saying you have one brick that's going lower. And so we, you know, it did, and it didn't have the rapid discharge and it was go charging up to, you know, 135, 145, 155 miles. Um, and it looked like it had a normal charge. The problem was there was an impedance issue with those batteries. And as soon as you tried to grab that voltage back out of the batteries, uh, the voltage would simply drop and the car would lose power. Mm -hmm. And so it was very different from the resistance issues that we see with these individual cells. So YouTube, um, it looks like uh, Niles is also commenting again. He's saying, okay, good. It sounds like the defective cells were not weeded out at Tesla because of poor quality control at the time. Yes. Well, Tesla does test all of their cells. Now, remember, these packs that we're talking about developed a resistive cell 12 to 15 years after right. the production of these batteries. I think it would have been very difficult to do any kind of predictive analysis on a cell that was going to fail a decade later. It yeah. was probably so subtle that it passed their screen at the time that they put it into the pack. That's right. I don't think it was an issue with co quality control at all on these first packs. And uh, my own personal opinion, in the absence of more information from Tesla on the 2016 packs, I have a feeling that it was a manufacturer issue with the cells and the battery. Again, not a Tesla QA issue at all but probably something that happened where nobody knew, even the manufacturer right. at the time, that they had put out a potentially bad batch of cells. And, you know, it's probably worth mentioning that um, we had a similar occurrence in our critical power business. In yes, the, we did. In the UPS business. We service uninterruptible power systems all over the United States, and they have battery plants or um, uh, cabinets. And in that world, oddly enough, they're still using lead acid batteries. They right. haven't migrated to, um, to, you know, lithium ion or any of the newer technologies. Fortunately, they are absorbent glass mat batteries, so they are maintenance free. We're not talking about, well, some still have the old wet cells. Kind of we thing, we but, do have yeah. some with old wet cells. <laughs> uh, lithium ion is starting to take hold in the critical power industry. Uh, I would say it's um, it's been in the marketplace for less than five years and still right. is a, a vast minority of what's out there. So but, folks, you have to picture this. Um, some of the work that we do in data centers, in the battery um, uh, systems, they still use wet cells in some cases. And they have to separate those from the data center because they gas mm -hmm. and they put out hydrogen as mm -hmm. they're charging, which is highly explosive. So um, they have these special rooms they have these steel racks, massive steel racks that hold jars that are about this tall, this wide, and this deep that weigh over 100 pounds, 120 pounds, full of sulfuric acid, lead plates, of course, mm -hmm. and they're 2.2 volts each, each jar. So you have to hook a whole bunch of them in series in order to come up to your string voltage, which for a UPS is typically 240 to 480 volts DC. Right. right. But anyway, to get back to the original intent of this story or this deviation, <laughs> the majority are um, absorbent glass mat batteries, which is an AGM battery, which is the next uh, generation of gel cells, mm -hmm. which allows the uh, case to be completely sealed, so you're not getting any gassing, and you never and um, you never have to insert sulfuric acid, right? Or take readings with a hygrometer, you know, which, right. which is something right. else you have exactly. to do. Um, so we ended up we have these batteries manufactured for us in China and Vietnam, and our uh, Chinese vendor that we've been using for many years that private labels these batteries for us. Uh, was expanding, and they moved some of the production capacity to Vietnam, I believe. Actually, it was to a different factory inside of China. They, inside of China, okay. Yeah, they had one at, at, uh, at Shenzhen, and I don't remember where the other one was. The, the good batteries came from Shenzhen. The, the, the poor quality batteries come from a different uh, location. So if I remember correctly, this was a new manufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. The uh, production processes were not yet well ingrained in the staff, apparently. Correct. And we ended up getting batteries that had a, less electrolyte in them, 
than that, was necessary. That's right. They, they only had between 50 and 60% of the electrolyte, in this case, sulfuric acid, that they were supposed to have in the batteries. Now, whether they were negligent, trying to save money, if the, uh, the meters weren't reading correctly, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But what ended up happening, it's a, it's, it's a strange thing in the battery business, and this is going to come full closure now. Uh, you don't know you've got a problem until some time has gone by. These batteries look just fine. They passed all the initial tests, yep. even with the low electrolyte. And it was a year or so after being installed out on site that our customers began to realize that they're not getting the ride through time, which is a term that's used in UPS. The power drops out. How long can you run on UPS? It's usually about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so. These were failing within the first minute or two. And we began to realize that we've got a problem with the batteries. Right, and it was an impedance problem with the batteries, right. um, not a resistance or a conductance issue, uh, and it was that the batteries would charge full, would hold voltage, but as soon as you put a load on those batteries, the voltage would drop out to, a, in this case, to a level that the UPS safety systems would kick in and would shut down. Right. And so it was the same symptom um, uh, that we had in the UPSs back in 2014 and 2015, that we are that we were seeing in these Tesla batteries that were manufactured in 2016 in the Tesla Roadsters, yes, exactly. And you know the hallmark of any great manufacturer is taking full responsibility for something like this, which is something Tesla does quite uh, quite uh, uh, repeatedly, often. Yes. Um, our our manufacturer, our OEM, uh, the original equipment manufacturer of our private label batteries, took full responsibility. We ended up. They even flew a team out here. There were three people here for mm -hmm. a month or more. And we methodically went through every location that we had put those batteries in. We went back out. We replaced them for the customer, and uh, everything worked once it, we fixed them. It did. It worked well. We still have a good relationship with the OEM. Uh, it was very costly to them, but uh, they, they, you know when you have somebody with good service when you see what they do when something goes wrong. Exactly. And these guys really stepped up to the plate for us. That's a true test of a vendor that you choose is um, how do they treat you when something isn't going right? Yes. So, okay, um, guys, real quick. Yes. Just so you know, we're at one hour, seven minutes. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, we have a few more questions that we want to get to then, and uh, we'll be closing up soon. Um, on YouTube, um, first, Trucker Alistair. Uh, couldn't say better. Uh, he was referring to my resistive cell explanation. Thank you very much, Trucker. I, I'm, I'm glad I can make sense sometimes. My wife says I don't make sense most of the time. Oh, you have one of those too. Oh, all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's wonderful. I, I, I love my wife. Uh, on YouTube, Core Glass. Uh, I heard Tesla's LFC batteries can be safely left in storage at low and at high charge levels. Question. I don't know. Um, you know, the um, conversation I had yesterday with Tesla corporate regarding the Tesla Roadster batteries that they were pre-manufacturing, the 1,000-pound battery packs, is that they were on a very strict recharging schedule. It's kind of like what we do in our battery warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, all of the batteries are constantly top-charged. We, uh, we carefully monitor. We have special equipment that does that. And, uh, yeah, Tesla was definitely uh, maintaining those batteries prior to installation in the car. Um, we did not get any sort of uh, specs from him, though, what kind of uh, levels they would charge to and what kind of bandwidth or what kind of uh, thresholds they were uh, using. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, on TikTok, Todd Reynolds 102 he says, love this, basement radio, keep it up. Uh, can the grid hold all this energy, which is fossil fuels? You know, um, we uh, did a video um, six months ago or so, and that question continuously came up. With this proliferation of electric vehicles, will the grid be able to keep up, or will it eventually just uh, cave this whole uh, transition to uh, uh, sustainable energy? In doing any video, we have to do a lot of research, fact-checking, mm -hmm. and uh, we were pleasantly surprised that the, uh, the expansion in the capacity, the grid capacity globally, not just in the U.S., is actually keeping pace with the projections. So, uh, yes, at this point in time, we can confidently say it is. And if you're interested, go to our YouTube channel. You'll find a video out there that addresses can the grid 
handle the load. And I think that's kind of the title, something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. I also know that, uh, you know, in case people don't know, Tesla is projecting $20 billion, with a B, dollars in revenue this year from the stationary battery systems. Is that right? And wow. basically these are, they call them mega packs. They're, they're huge battery packs that are meant to be stored out at power substations, ideally solar or wind substations, mm -hmm. to store excess energy generated during the day so that it can then be used at night. So YouTube, um, our Watch Rebuilds channel visitor, who um, does a shameless plug every time he asks a question, but we don't mind. We consider right. Rich a influencer and a partner if we can ever get him on our podcast. And again, a plug to uh, uh, remind Rich that we'd love to have him on our podcast. He makes a little play on words. He says, so you can be sheet out of luck. And he's referring to the uh, Tesla Roadster discussion we had earlier on the uh, sheet problems and brick problems. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Uh, Niles from the Bion Danish Genome Institute uh, responds to us again from the answer we had in our question uh, of his. Okay, good. It sounds like the defective cells were not weeded out at Tesla because of poor quality control at the time. Actually, we just talked oh, we about did, that. We just yeah. answered that yeah, one. And yes, that. the answer is yes on that. And then uh, Bernard Holman on YouTube. Uh, Saludos de Talusha, uh, Mexico. Uh, hope to visit... Gruber uh, Motors soon. So he is uh, saying hello from Toluca, I think is what, how that's pronounced. We have such a hard time with Spanish words, don't we? We do. We, yeah. we need to get Romero in here. <laughs> we do, yes. But yes, we'd love to have you visit, Bernard, and uh, daily tours. Uh, people love it. They enjoy it. Uh, can't wait to see you. Um, Eric Robertson. Eric, welcome from Texas. He says, curious to hear your thoughts on aftermarket DC fast charging kits for the Roadster. Safe or bad for original cells? Eric, we had a customer here a year or so ago that had this uh, Chatham or JDMO or whatever they call it now, DC fast charge modification done to the Tesla Roadster. He wasn't happy with it. He said in the first year, my CAC went down appreciably more than the previous years, and he attributes it to that fast charging. Um, we typically do not recommend doing that modification for a number of reasons. That that part is that is part of it, but the second mm -hmm. part is no Tesla service center is going to accept your roadster for service anymore because you've done a modification. We ran into that with a customer in Connecticut that I believe actually ended up taking it off so he could get Tesla to work on his Roadster. Um, it's a great idea on the surface, guys. What they do is they inject DC into se the same portion of the PEM that uh, will handle regen braking DC backfeed, you know, when you slow down mm -hmm. your car. Mm -hmm. The difference is regen has a duty cycle. It's not 100%. Sure. This charge method is 100% fast DC charge directly into the pack. Now, if there were some changes made to the electronics, which includes thermal management for that additional uh, you know, right. input, right. it probably makes sense, but I'm not sure that anybody can spend the amount of dollars that it's going to take to retrofit um, uh, the roadsters to do DC fast charging. Yeah, I think that's the biggest uh, risk that you would have is that these roadsters are simply not set up to be able to cool the battery while all of that heat is coming in through the DC fast charge. Uh, because that electrical current will absolutely generate heat from the internal resistance in the batteries themselves. And of course, it's a highly efficient way to charge. I mean, we're not discounting that for a moment. The battery's DC. Why not charge it with a direct DC path? Oh, yeah. Instead of going through, you know, converting it to AC to DC and then, you know, into the battery. So that's our take on it, Eric. By the way, thank you for joining us. And then on TikTok, uh, Viggy State uh, said, I spent 10 days in Italy. I only saw five electric cars. It looks like they're behind. You know, we, we found the same thing when we go to Europe. Certain countries just haven't caught on to the EV experience yet. And I think Elon's selection for Germany was the right one because it's uh, somewhat centrally located, but right. the Scandinavian countries are definitely into uh, you know EVs and clean energy, and the Germans, of course. 
Um, well, and I, I think that Germany has kind of an outsized influence on their neighbors. They're the, the largest country in that area, in that region, with the highest population. They have a very strong automotive culture. And I, th I, I honestly believe if Elon had moved elsewhere besides Germany, you would see a lot more resistance from the Germans. Sure. Now, let's not forget, though, <clears throat> there is an Italian auto manufacturer that is moving into electric vehicles very slowly, mind you. Well, yeah. They're, we're starting off with a hybrid here, but Lamborghini is actually making a hybrid next and will eventually make some EVs. Of course, their cars may not be affordable for everyone. No. Uh, but. Well, and, and I know this might slip into something that we'll talk about more tomorrow. Uh, Porsche, is not Porsche also Italian? German. A Porsche is German. Ferdinand Porsche. Okay. Okay. Uh, because they are, they're talking about making an electric Porsche Boxster. And I'm that one's a teaser cool. for tomorrow. We'll talk about that one more tomorrow. You know, it just occurred to me, I think there's another Italian EV too that I completely spaced, the Fiat, the Fiat EV. And I think oh, we sure. have two of them in our service center um, uh, currently. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Fiat is a very big in Italy, especially up in Northern Italy. We'd love to hear from you guys. Any other Italian EVs? And if there are a bunch, why aren't the why isn't the Italian pop, um, yeah, population adopting them? We're going to be there in uh, July, by the way. And uh, uh, on the following podcast, I'll I'll report back to you guys. We're even thinking about opening up a, a TikTok channel on my cell phone while I'm there. If I find something interesting, like a supercharger in the Alps. You oh know? yeah, yeah, I absolutely have to, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm. What I'm wondering is, do we do a Zoom call with you while you're in, while you're out in Europe, and do our podcast? I don't think you guys would like it. You'd probably be jealous because I'd be sitting there sipping some <laughs> wine in the French region, you know. While yeah, you guys that's are... <laughs> true. That's true. I and actually, Natalie probably would not like that either. That too. Yeah, yeah. She wants me to forget about work for two or three weeks during that trip, and uh, uh, it's going to be hard. But you know, I got to wean myself. Yeah, good. Good idea for her, though. That's that's yeah. good. Uh, Eric Robertson does say thank you as well. So and um, Eric, by the way, um, he also makes some really cool roadster stuff, uh, carbon fiber. If you get to the point where you'd like to promote some of that product, feel free to join us on this podcast. We'd love to have you do a, a, a full hour Zoom call or even a partial. We're thinking of doing the Johnny Carson thing where we have guests on for maybe 15 minutes instead right, of the full right. hour because you kind of sometimes run out of things to talk about. But yeah, uh, uh, consider that. We'd love to have you on our show. Uh, YouTube, Alex says, did I miss you guys talking about the three new roadsters found? E thanks for reminding me. We we're going to give you a little bit more information there toward the end. You did miss it, by the way. But the uh, bids are up to $750,000 at this point for all three of them. People are still talking about splitting them. Well, can I buy one and get a battery for it? And I, you know, I immediately tell them, look, you're going to pay way over market for this roadster because it's got zero miles. The instant you fix it up, and start driving it, all your equity is going to evaporate because that's what makes these things so special. Then it becomes a used car again, and you know, you're gonna lose the value in the car. In my mind, these three cars, and I've said this a hundred times, I'm mm -hmm. gonna keep saying it, need to go to the Tesla Gigaplants. They need to be front and center in the lobby showing people that come to visit these plants what Tesla's history and what their iconic first early adopter cars were all about. These are museum pieces. Now, the other second option for me would be the Peterson Auto Museum or any of these places where they, these cars can be enjoyed by the general public. There's a good uh, write-up and dissertation about what the history of this car is. Um, these are very special. And uh, anyway, that would be my first choice. I would hate to see them go to some wealthy guy in Dubai that's going to tuck them into a large storage facility to let them appreciate and value and no, no one ever gets to enjoy them. These are cars that really do need to be enjoyed in my mind. So Elon, if you're listening, let's take a portion of that Twitter money and pump that into these three roasters and put that into the lobbies of some of these gigafactories. I think your visitors and the employees would find a lot of value in having these cars there. Oh, I think so as well. You know, Texas, Berlin, Fremont, there you go. Yeah. And there are only three of them at this point. That's right. Well, should we be wrapping up at this point? I think so. I think we're about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, hour and 20. Hour and 20, okay. 
Tomorrow, we've got our general EV broadcast. Uh, we'll take the focus off of roadsters a bit and get back into the uh, broader issues of electric vehicles, sustainable energy, and the migration of transportation to removing fossil fuel burners off the roads. And uh, look forward to that tomorrow. Lots of topics, lots of news coming up with uh, the different cars. Feel free to send us topics that you want as well. Uh, email us, ev at gruber.com. We'd, be, uh, we'd love to entertain your topics and information. I know that uh, Niles, our Bion Danish Genome Institute uh, a commenter here today, had sent us a couple of videos this last week, and we found them to be fascinating, and they were, happened in that case to be about artificial intelligence. So keep that coming. Uh, thank you guys for joining us so much. Appreciate it. We'll see you next week or tomorrow.